Before I explain the puzzle, let me just say a few words on the neutrino itself. A neutrino is a tiny fundamental particle. Think of it like a really, really tiny and electrically neutral version of an electron. The name is Italian. It literally means little neutral one. Well, it's Italian-ish. Neutrinos are tiny, tiny little subatomic particles that were first proposed to solve a particular problem in nuclear physics. And one of their features is that they almost never interact with normal matter. And when I say almost never, it really is incredibly rare. If you wanted to build a neutrino shield around the sun to prevent all those neutrino radiation from coming out, you'd have to surround the sun with about a light year of lead. So you'd have to surround the sun with a lead, she uh, lead shell that goes about a quarter of the way to the nearest star. And even then, you'd only stop about half of the neutrinos. So they really, really don't like to talk to matter. And one of the things that means for us is that once the sun makes them, they freely escape. All of the normal energy, so the photons and the kinetic energy of the atoms and everything, all of that takes tens or even hundreds of thousands of years to bounce around inside the sun before it manages to finally stumble its way out to the surface and be radiated out into space. Neutrinos just whiz out. They don't get stopped, which means that if we could figure out some way of collecting these neutrinos, it'll give us a way of testing what's going on inside the sun right this minute, rather than 10 or even 100,000 years ago. The first attempt to do that was conducted in the 1960s in a mine in South Dakota called the Homestake Mine. Essentially, a bunch of really prominent neutrino physicists at the time came up with this idea that they could test the solar model. Everything that we know about the inside of the sun comes from computer models in the same way that we know about what the inside of, say, the Earth or Jupiter is like by using computer models and then testing those models using observables that we can measure from outside. We'd like to do the same thing with the solar model. So we take this prediction of the solar model, which tells us how many neutrinos the sun should make every second. Then we build a lab and we try and test that. And the way that these particular physicists tried to test this prediction was they basically found this empty part of an old mine. The mine is deep underground, so it protects them from all the nasty cosmic rays that would other, otherwise muck up the experiment. Brought in what was essentially a very sophisticated kiddie pool and filled it up with, I swear this is true, cleaning fluid. Cleaning fluid has, it turns out, a bunch of chlorine atoms in it. And if you bounce a neutrino, just purely by accident, into a chlorine atom, that makes a radioactive nucleus that you can then measure. So you can measure how many times neutrinos bump into the chlorine in all this cleaning fluid, and that'll get you an idea of how many neutrinos are streaming through your lab. So they carried out this experiment, they filled up this vat with cleaning fluid, they stood back, they waited for a few months, they counted how many neutrinos came through, and to their dismay, the prediction of this solar model hypothesis turned out to be wrong. They found only about a third as many neutrinos as they were expecting, given the requirements of the solar model. So at this point, the kind of baseline discussion of the scientific process that we've gone through implies that what you should do is you should go back and revise your hypothesis. We have to figure out what's going wrong in the solar model and fix it. The problem is that the kind of corrections you would have to make would then be in tension with a bunch of other measurements that you could make in the sun. So the solar model did a really good job of predicting lots of other things that you could measure about the sun. So what's the density of the sun? How large is it? What's its total luminosity? What's its total mass? And is that consistent with the total luminosity? The sun even has sunquakes and you can predict quite successfully how sunquakes behave using that version of the solar model. So the first thing that everybody did was say, oh, well, we screwed up our experiment because scientists are humans and sometimes humans make mistakes. So 
There were a bunch of different versions of this experiment carried out in different locations by different teams of scientists, and they all were finding that they were getting about the same wrong answer, that they were only finding about a third the number of neutrinos that they were expecting based on the predictions of this model. So this is really a problem. This is not just some experimenter error. And at this point, you might have to take a long, hard look at your model, but every once in a while, when something like this happens, that's a really interesting harbinger of new physics. So sometimes when your model does crazy things, that tells you that there's something fundamental you're not understanding about the universe, and that's what happened in this case. This was the first hint that neutrinos didn't really behave the way we expect them to. As this problem developed, there was a really interesting proposal made by a bunch of theoretical physicists, the kind of people who do most of their work with pencil and paper or on a chalkboard. And they came up with this idea that maybe, just maybe, neutrinos can change on their way from the sun. There's this important feature of neutrinos that we haven't talked about called flavor. Why astronomers and physicists decided to call types of neutrinos different flavors, I don't know. Maybe charge was already taken. But there are three basic flavors of neutrinos. They have actual real scientific names. They're called electron, muon, and tau neutrinos. But for the purposes of this discussion, I'm just going to call them vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry because those are a little more familiar. The sun makes only vanilla neutrinos. So when we first started building our experiments, we built ne vanilla neutrino detectors. We were only looking for those vanilla neutrinos because those were the only ones we were expecting to find. And we only found a third as many as there should have been. And the reason for that is that these neutrinos are sneaky little buggers, and they will spontaneously change flavor on the way from the sun to the Earth. So that vanilla neutrino that the sun made might suddenly pop and become a strawberry neutrino, and then chocolate, and then back to strawberry, and back to vanilla, and then chocolate again, in this quasi-random process. And the result of this is that by the time all of those vanilla neutrinos make it from the sun to the Earth, they're not vanilla anymore. They're now a more or less even mix of vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. So essentially, the sun manufactured a gallon of vanilla ice cream, but by the time it made it to the Earth, suddenly we open that up and discover that it's Neapolitan. So if that's true, that'll solve the solar neutrino problem. But we have to check. And the way that we check is to use basically really heavily advanced versions of that original experiment. We're going to build not small kiddie pools, but giant vats in mines underground. You can see one of those pictured on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, this is an interior image of Super Kamiokanda in Japan. If you look on the bottom of that image, you'll see a pair of men in rowboats that are servicing this detector. And that gives you a sense of the truly enormous scale of Super Kamiokanda, or Super K for short. Super K has a counterpart in Canada called the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, sometimes referred to as SNOW. And Super K and SNOW detect not just vanilla neutrinos, but all of them. So they sat and they counted up the neutrinos coming from the sun. They counted the vanilla neutrinos along with the chocolate and the strawberry. And when they finished, they found that all of the expected neutrinos really were there so that the sun was making all of the neutrinos it ought to make. But then those solar neutrinos were changing types on the way from the sun, and so we missed about two-thirds of them in our early experiments. So at the end of the day, we found out that that original solar model was actually basically right. It was doing a really good job describing what the sun was like in the inside, but it just missed that one important piece of neutrino physics that would allow us to correctly predict the outcomes of our experiments. So all in all, the solar neutrino problem, once it was solved, provides really strong evidence 
that we really do know what's going on inside the sun. We had this really complicated, hard problem that once we figured out how to solve it, showed that our original predictions were basically right. So we've talked about what the sun is like in its inside. The sun is basically just a big ball of hot gas. In order to maintain its shape, it has to be in hydrostatic equilibrium. That balance between the inward force of gravity and the outward force of pressure. To have really high pressure in its interior and resist all of the downward gravitational force from all the stuff above the sun's core, the core has to be really hot and really dense. That high temperature and density allows fusion to happen, where hydrogen nuclei smash together at tremendous speed and turn into helium. When that happens, as a byproduct of that process, we get a couple of neutrinos coming out. We can predict exactly how many neutrinos the sun should make every second because we know how much energy it has to make every second. And then we test that prediction by measuring the solar neutrinos that are easily escaping from the sun and making it to our labs here on the Earth. We managed to capture a few of those, and we found initially far too few. That failed prediction of the hypothesis that is the solar model, that failed prediction is the solar neutrino problem. We eventually managed to solve that solar neutrino problem by figuring out that neutrinos change type on the way from the sun, and ultimately, once we did a better version of the experiment, we found that the original prediction of that hypothesis that we call the solar model was correct. So the original solar model was basically right once we figured out how to appropriately count all of the neutrinos that the sun was making. Thank you for your attention, and I'll see you next time.